Thank you very much for that welcome, uh, Dr. Lee. Um, I, uh, I do want to talk to you today about uh, my uh, first book, Eight Dependence in Cambodia, How Foreign Assistance Undermines Democracy. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Christine for this incredible uh, forum here um, and the job she's done. Um, but, uh, you know, some good news this morning. I, uh, as you know, I'm, uh, as you might know, I'm on the uh, I'm a counselor for the Cambodian Center for Human Rights, and we just heard that uh, Mom Sinando, who uh, was sentenced to 20 years in prison, this radio broadcaster, has been, uh, well, not yet released, but I think he's going to be free soon. And uh, the Court of Appeals has found him essentially guilty of certain things, but it's putting him under house arrest or under some sort of uh, uh, suspended sentence. So, good news on, on, on that. Let me, uh, let me talk a bit about uh, my own background. So I'm, I, I, as Dr. Lee mentioned, I teach at the Naval Postgraduate School, and I teach courses on um, political economy. So how, how, how does one explain things like this? You know, the difference between, uh, in, within a city, uh, between, say, a slum next to a high-rise, luxury high-rise. And I teach this to students um, who are junior military officers, people who come back from Iraq and Afghanistan and who uh, have been very good at breaking things, uh, breaking countries, and now need to learn how to put them back together again. So uh, I teach courses also on post-conflict reconstruction. Um, and oftentimes these students want to know how to do things, how to rebuild countries, and they sort of list from A to Z. You know, Tell me the first thing you need to do and then the last thing you need to do, and I have to tell them that it's not as simple as that. There's no um, nation building for dummies, really. Uh, that the work that they do isn't going to be like this, where you've got a blueprint for a house and you're just going to build it, and suddenly you'll have a nation state come out of there. Or that they can somehow map out all the counterinsurgency dynamics in Afghanistan and figure out who is behind uh, you know, the Taliban, for example. That is much more difficult than that, or rather, that it requires less planning and much more adaptive learning, so that the metaphor for the work that we do, the work that I do, is a lot more like gardening than anything else. So in gardening, you have to look at the weather. You have to look at, uh, you have to know the soil. You have to talk to the people who live there, who are the experts, really. You're not the expert. You're coming from the outside. You might not know how to, uh, you know, when to prune the rose bushes because the season isn't right. So the, the real message for so much of the work that we do is this illusion of control that I need to dispel in my students. So gardeners have no illusion of control. We create the right growing conditions, nurture a healthy soil life, set up our lifestyle so we have time to tend our crops, and we plant a diverse variety of sturdy, healthy plants and watch them grow. We adjust as we go along, removing excess weeds, mulching, watering, fertilizing when necessary, and picking off pests. But ultimately, Ultimately, the end result almost always includes crop failures and unexpected successes, and we feel more like stewards, sometimes even observers and masters of our domain. Now, of course, you're listening to a guy who actually does this to his plants, so I should warn you <laughs> that I don't have a very green thumb. But with that caveat in mind, I just want to make sure that I give you some context as to why I'm interested in Cambodia. After all, this is the Climate Studies Forum. Why would I write a book on Cambodia? Well, you know, a few years ago, in 2009, I had the opportunity to speak at, at TED. Now, how many of you are familiar with TED? All right, so it, it's a phenomenon that's growing, and I think a lot more people now know what TED is about. Uh, it used to be, when I said TED, they think it was this uh, commuter airline from United. Um, but actually, I had this opportunity, this wonderful opportunity to share the story of my family's escape, my mother's cunning and determination to get her five children, uh, myself included, out of, out of Cambodia during uh, the, the Khmer Rouge period. And the great thing about that talk is that I had, she was there. She, she was able to join me at the end and uh, to get a standing ovation from the audience. My wife, eight months pregnant at the time with our first child, was also there, along with some very important people in the audience. So. You know, I had this feeling at the time that maybe she wouldn't, I wouldn't get to do another trip with her. Um, maybe we wouldn't have an opportunity to travel together. She was getting older, and um, you, you kind of have a feeling sometimes that uh, 
things aren't going to go on forever. And so little did I know, seven months later, she passed away. So it got me to think about the legacy she left behind and some of the lessons uh, she taught me. And the first lesson, of course, is that having been blessed with the opportunity to escape Cambodia, to go to France and the United States via Vietnam, that to those whom much is given, much is expected, as Kennedy said. So that's one of the lessons that drives my work, that uh, gives me the sense of responsibility for you know, having been blessed with so much opportunity and now needing to do something about it and to give back. So let me talk a little bit about the context of Cambodia, my own personal history here. My parents in 1969 enjoying a uh, uh, promenade somewhere, perhaps. Um, the house we lived in in the center of Phnom Penh uh, off of the road to the airport. I had a chance a couple of years ago to visit that house while filming for a documentary on our family story. And 10 families now live in that house, uh, one to each room. Now, Cambodia, of course, as many of you know, was the Pearl of Asia, uh, also the island of peace at that time. 1965, Lee Kuan Yew goes there to learn about nation building. A few months later, August 65, he would actually suffer the separation uh, between Singapore and the Federation, and he'd be in tears, but at this point, at least, he was hugging uh, Prince Sihanouk, uh, head of state, and, and, and understanding what an example Cambodia was for, uh, for his own future country. Um, uh, Phnom Penh, of course, was an architectural delight, remains so in some places. Here, a film that Sihanouk himself had, uh, I believe, directed, and I believe it's him here, uh, playing the little prince. Uh, really, a, I don't want to romanticize the place, but it was, it was probably a, a very lovely, peaceful place. I'm sure Don, uh, Jameson, who's here and served as a diplomat, can attest to that. But across the world, we know that something else was going on. In 1970, President Nixon was pointing to Cambodia, and uh, he had this to say about Cambodia at that time. There are no American combat troops in Cambodia. There are no American combat advisors in Cambodia. There will be no American combat troops or advisors in Cambodia. We will aid Cambodia. Cambodia is the Nixon doctrine in its purest form. Uh, now, when, when did he mean by that? Um, I, I shudder to think. Of course, what he meant by that was that B-52s would be dropping uh, their bombs in Cambodia. They've done that for several years already. But apparently, you know, if you don't come to democracy, democracy will come to you at times. And in uh, large swaths of Cambodia from 1965 to 1973, uh, more tons of bombs fell uh, tonnage-wise than in all of World War II Europe, uh, in addition to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, out in Japan. And you know all this, of course, in April 1975, 17th of April, the, kind of the, the, the capital city falls. There's a um, spirit of, uh, I'm sure, uh, feeling of, of joy in the sense that, hey, the war is ending. Uh, maybe the violence will end too. Uh, but of course, the young people who arrived in the city, the, these uh, teenage Khmer Rouge soldiers, were not interested in peace. And while there were these enemies of, of the state that had been named, actually the entire city became <coughs> enemies of the Khmer Rouge. And the violence began. Now, the exodus of two million people, perhaps even three million from Phnom Penh, in the course of three days, including my own family, had a great impact on us. Uh, these images from that time are quite telling. Um, and of course, where were they sent? They were sent to labor camps you all know, uh, labor camps that were not exactly uh, conducive to city folks. The leaders of the Khmer Rouge, Pol Pot there on the left, uh, <clears throat> he himself never faced justice. He was uh, put under house arrest and uh, tried under Khmer Rouge process, but not really saw, he never really saw justice in the, in the strictest sense of the world. And really, Cambodia, I, I can't give you a, a better sense than this quote that I have found very much like to use for my opportunity. Once upon a time, there was a regime so evil that it created anti-society, where torture was currency and music, books, and love were abolished. Uh, this regime ruled for four years and murdered nearly two million of its citizens, a quarter of the population. Now, that's one in four people. And one in four people, you know, a million, two million people, that's a very difficult number to, to kind of grasp. Um, so 
you know, uh, I'm sure many of you have been there, but I want to take those of you who haven't to a place called Tulslang, uh, S21, where uh, a school was turned into a uh, torture center, now a museum. But behind barbed wires where 16,000 people, up to 16,000 people were killed, where behind barbed wires in classroom turned into uh, torture chambers on uh, beds and uh, using medieval looking torture devices. Uh, these individuals, often mothers with their infants here, uh, reaching out, were killed. <coughs> Babies, literally. Uh, boys, uh, teenagers, um, girls, children, all had their lives exterminated and ended up in killing fields. So my book begins really where that leaves off. I, I am not all that interested in necessarily uh, examining that period. I'm looking at the more recent period. So you fast forward uh, a couple of, uh, uh, to 1979, when Vietnam invades Cambodia. And of course, a decade of Vietnamese occupation does not help Cambodia strategically because Vietnam is allied with the Soviet Union, which is enemies with the United States. And so the Khmer Rouge are essentially backed by the United States during this time. Uh, but it takes the Paris Peace Accords of 1991 to uh, see the end of the Cambodia conflict, in that sense, um, because the end of the Cold War comes. And there's no use anymore in keeping the old geopolitical divides. So seeing up here, the late King Father now, uh, clapping away at the signing of the Paris Peace Accords, actually accused him of right here. Um, <clears throat> and the UN comes into Cambodia in 1992, uh, forming the biggest peacekeeping operation in the history of the, uh, of, of, of the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia, where I think you know, the goal was certainly to uh, bring peace to Cambodia, to fix the administration, to hold an election to um, canton the forces, among many other uh, goals in its mandate. But I'm sure those of you who've been to, uh, Siem, uh, to uh, Siem Reap will have gone to the Cambodian Cultural Center. And this is what, um, leave it to uh, Cambodians to uh, have some humor from this experience. But what do you see here? Anybody? Scream it out. I, I want some interaction here. I mean, what's happening here? Rich, surely you know. Yeah, it's a brothel. It's, uh, it's the lady of the night with a peacekeeper. Um, and actually, the late Richard Holbrook, who um, visited Cambodia in 1992, um, was so concerned when he saw you know, all the prostitution that was going on that he, uh, he, he wrote to the head of the uh, UN mission, Yasushi Akashi, to, to just warn him, you know, you're doing great work, your peacekeepers are doing great, but you really have to uh, be careful about the spread of AIDS, HIV AIDS, and he did, never got a response from, from, from his letter, and uh, when Akashi was asked at a press conference, you know, uh, what about these brothels? I mean, don't you worry about, uh, about this? Uh, his response was, boys will be boys. Um, I think a very uh, typical response, but also a very sad response. Uh, more importantly, um, the first test of the UN's resolve was when Akashi and his force commander, um, I think General Sanderson of Australia, uh, arrived at a bamboo pole manned by a teenage Khmer Rouge soldier, and they needed to cross this bamboo pole to go into Khmer Rouge controlled territory. Um, it's, well, the boy refused to lift the pole. They refused to insist that they had the authority to go through and instead turned back. And I think this was the, the, the first test of what became the resolve or lack of resolve by the United Nations in confronting the Khmer Rouge during this period of time and in essentially showing their hand that they were not really willing to, uh, to go head to head with the Khmer Rouge. So not surprisingly, when the election rolls around in 93, uh, even though uh, Prince Ranarit wins the plurality of the vote, uh, he is forced into an arrangement 
albeit by his father, Sihanouk, uh, into, into essentially accepting a no winners, no losers outcome. That uh, essentially he will have to share power with, uh, with Prime Minister Hun Sen, who had been Prime Minister since 1985. So instead of having one Prime Minister, you end up with two Prime Ministers, and the first, I think, ever instance of that. Uh, equal powers, and you can just imagine you know, two tigers on one mountain and what's going to happen. So by 1997, uh, a coup happens. And while Hun Sen does not replace, uh, well, does not simply remove the position, he replaces uh, Rana with a more malleable uh, foreign minister from the Front Impact Party, which you know, ends up giving him control, basically, over the, the government during that time. So now let's fast forward uh, to 2000, 2010, and a couple of billion dollars later, in foreign aid. And I want to paint for you a picture of essentially uh, a, uh, an, an aid system that is, that is uh, quite pervasive. So for uh, the period 2002 to 2010, for every dollar that the Cambodian government spent, um, on average it received 94.3 cents in foreign aid, in net foreign aid during that period. So I'm telling you, if, I, if, you, if, you, if you spend a dollar, I'll give you nearly a dollar. Um, can you imagine what the incentives are? I mean, if you think of a welfare system where, you know, for every dollar you spend, uh, I'll give you another dollar, you would probably not be very incentivized to collect your own tax revenues because that's your own money. That's not their money, the outsider's money. So uh, tax revenues in Cambodia end up being about 8.6% of GDP during the period of 2000 to 2010, which is less than the amount of foreign aid that comes into Cambodia. And I argue as the main causality of, of, of why foreign assistance undermines democracy, uh, that essentially foreign assistance substitutes for domestic revenues, that it, it, it becomes this, uh, this, this incentive for, for the country not to collect as much, as much tax revenues. And the reason why it undermines democracy is that tax revenues and paying taxes, I think, is a necessary part of democracy. So if you pay taxes, you then expect your government to listen to you when you uh, say, hey, we actually think you should spend your money here on you know, services as opposed to other things like defense or uh, buying more weapons, for example. Uh, that the link between the people and the government is then more tenuous, that, it's, uh, that the accountability factor in terms of uh, taxation and representation is severed. So, you know, those of you who are familiar with Washington, D.C., know the saying that, you know, D.C. residents love to, love to put down, which is, you know, taxation without representation. Well, here, I would say it's more no taxation means no representation, and that's the outcome of that has happened in Cambodia, I would argue, over that period of time. Now, it's not to say that Cambodia doesn't have money. Uh, the money is getting collected, it's just getting collected as, as bribes and corruption money. So, during the, the mid-2000s, several estimates of corruption in Cambodia uh, were undertaken, and um, the range of three to five hundred million uh, was, uh, was estimated, I, I think it's an annual amount, um, that kind of money could make a difference between enough revenues and uh, the kinds of revenues that are now observed in Cambodia. And I think that since that period of time, you've had, you, you can see far more in, in, in corruption money, but more recent estimates haven't been uh, done. In terms of foreign aid, uh, I know this is a complicated graph, but the numbers I point to are, you know, these net ODA, uh, Official uh, Development Assistance, $700 million range. Uh, the commitments are more like a billion dollars these days. But, but I think, you know, to give you that sense of, of how heavy, how, how extreme the amount of uh, assistance has been in a country, mind you, that is supposed to be developing, right? So if you're developing, you're not, you should be getting less money, perhaps, not more money uh, in foreign aid. And, and uh, as you can see, this, this, this kind of picture is, is sad. Uh, there's no China in this list here because China doesn't participate in this 
exercise. Uh, it did at one point, but uh, it doesn't really report what it's doing to uh, the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Richmond's Club. Now, what happens to development during this period of time, right? Um, if you look at maternal mortality, you see that um, in 2000, it was 440 mothers per 100,000 live births that died. By uh, 2004, it jumps up to over 470. Uh, by 2008, it goes down to 460, but it's still higher than in 2000. And this is at a time when you're seeing 10, almost 10% 10 GDP per capita growth. Things should not be looking like this. In terms of inequality, uh, the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality, is with uh, the Gini is one, then one person has got all the wealth in the country. Uh, it went from 0.38 in 1994 to 0.42 in 2004 to 0.44 in 2007. So you have growing inequality at the same time. So somebody is getting the money, it's just not the average person. What happened to democracy and to governance during this time? If you look at measures of governance, uh, and here I will unfortunately give you several, several measures here, but the bottom line is, as you can see, nothing is happening during the period of 1996 to 2008. You can see some increases and some declines, but the only trend that perhaps is showing improvement is this dotted line here, which is political stability. In terms of government effectiveness, there's been a general decline, more recently maybe an uptick, but generally the only thing that appears to be working is political stability. And if I, um, uh, you know, I, I think for most of us who are familiar with Cambodia, this picture here will not be uh, so surprising. I mean, courtesy of the Phnom Penh Post, uh, Prime Minister here in this uh, black box and his in-laws in the yellow boxes who run different ministries and different um, uh, significant uh, parts of the government. Uh, Hok Man Di has died. He has been replaced, I believe, by another in-law. But uh, essentially, if you look at political stability, you've got the same prime minister since 1985. Uh, of course, you have political stability. But this is all very big picture-ish. So I want to bring it down to a certain case uh, level approach, and I will uh, do that in the next uh, 20 minutes here. Uh, I want to talk to you about four cases uh, from the book. Now, not all of these are chapters from the book. A couple of these are chapters from the book, but the other ones are kind of discussed throughout the book. So the first one is rule of law and what I call the, the capture of property rights. Uh, second case is the experience of, of Cambodia with avian influenza. Uh, actually, a very interesting story of how a virus uh, knows politics and knows how to stay out during the election period. Um, Case three, garment sector. I, it's not going to be so depressing. There is a success story there. And then case four, I'll end with the Khmer Rouge Tribunal and how the good intentions of the West in terms of North penetration, bringing Western standards of justice into Cambodia, have gone terribly wrong. So let me, let me talk about the rule of law and the capture of property rights. So many of you are familiar with Bong uh, Lake, which is um, a lake in the center of Phnom Penh that uh, 20,000 people lived around. Um, about three to 4,000 families. It's a, a real uh, refreshing thing to have in the middle of the city, especially on a hot, hot day. Uh, in the evenings, a wonderful place to turn to for drinks. Uh, and in the flooding, uh, in, in, the, in the rainy season, the floods could at least have a place to go to in terms of excess uh, drainage. So uh, the municipality of Phnom Penh sold this lake to a Chinese backed company. And uh, you know, why would a company want to buy a lake? Not to have water sports on it, uh, but to fill it in with, uh, with dirt and to build on it. So from this angle, it doesn't look like a horrible thing. You know, just filling in a lake, right? But of course, we know what happens. Uh, we know that the, uh, the process of filling in that lake has been extremely damaging to the people living around it. And, and one of the saddest things is that the, the folks living around that lake, some of whom were offered $7,500, I think, for their property, uh, you know, have had to move. And those who haven't been offered anything, of course, are really pissed off. But, but the, the, the bottom line is property in, in that area is not worth $7,500, okay? The, the, that property is much more valuable. And at the same time uh, that all this was happening, the World Bank was doing a land titling project, which 
enabled it to give land titles to residents of Phnom Penh. For whatever reason, and the bank admits that it was tricked in this regard, it somehow was told not to give land titles to the people living around Bangkok Lake. So it essentially uh, disenfranchised them from the, their ability to protect their property. Um, and of course, they protested uh, because they were being evicted. And of course, the protests lead to violence from the authorities, which uh, of course ends very badly. So we've seen this here. We've seen it elsewhere. Uh, the most recent egregious case, of course, was a 14-year-old girl named Hen Chanta who in May 2012 fought her family's eviction and was killed uh, in another part of Cambodia. Now, that's an example of how foreign assistance can sometimes lead to unintended consequences with respect to property rights and rule of law. In terms of uh, avian influenza, uh, bird flu, um, the, 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 the image I want to start off with here is of this gentleman, uh, the eighth victim of avian influenza in Cambodia, and how he was discovered by a U.S. naval medical lab in Cambodia. Uh, and then the next victim is discovered by a naval, area medical, naval medical lab. The first several victims all die. The first one actually is discovered in Vietnam, before she dies. And so the narrative is one of, you know, Cambodia has a terrible, terrible healthcare system. Uh, people who get this new pathogen, this new disease, can't even be discovered by the healthcare system. Uh, they have to be discovered by outsiders, and uh, they all die except for this lucky guy and the next guy after him. And then after that, everybody dies, and then a couple. And I think this little girl survives because she is uh, taken to Gantabupa uh, Hospital, the Swiss run uh, hospital, Swiss funded hospital. So the, the idea of bird flu and, 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 and surveillance uh, for disease is that you would find the disease before. It is uh, before it transfers over to humans. So these are places where animal outbreaks happen in Cambodia, okay, from 2004 to 2008. This is where human victims were discovered. And so you kind of see that, hey, there's a kind of relationship between these things. So if you can find the animals before uh, the humans, you might actually know that the disease is coming and you might stop it before it uh, reaches humans. But actually, the sad truth of it is that the humans are found and then the animals are killed afterwards. So the canaries in the coal mine are the humans, and the animals are then discovered. And why is that? Well, because really donors in that case were really interested in finding, in stopping a disease from arriving on their shores. So what to do in terms of detecting the disease, doesn't matter if it's a human being or an animal, let's just kill uh, it at its source. And the solution is really quite terrible, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I want to give you a sense of what I mean by a virus that knows politics. So um, at the 2008 election, when <coughs> Prime Minister uh, casting his ballot, the, uh, the fascinating thing is that um, for a period of a year before the election, there are no outbreaks whatsoever of this disease. And it's, it's, it's incredible. Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, all having outbreaks. Cambodia is disease-free. Uh, why is that? Well positive results in animals are being suppressed. So you can kind of see where the, the incentives to reporting are. Uh, moreover, the elite also have their hands in tourism, and tourism is 14% of Cambodia's economy. So there's really very little incentive to uh, promoting a negative image of uh, Cambodia having outbreaks, strange diseases, things like that. It's, it's, uh, it's of course, not good for, for business. Now, I mentioned earlier how Maybe the cure was worse than the disease. So the cure, not the cure, but the, the way to control this disease is to kill the, the poultry. So one of the brilliant ideas from the authorities was, uh, let's not compensate people when we go kill their, their chickens. Uh, well, if you're not going to compensate them, they're never going to call you up, right? If, because if they call you up, authorities are going to come and kill your, your chickens, your livelihoods. So nobody's reporting anything. And so is it surprising that, uh, this is stated from the Cambodia Daily February 11th, that there have been five cases, five human victims in three weeks, uh, a real disturbing situation where I think the donors have an incentive to uh, make sure the disease is stopped so they don't care if, if in the end um, animals get killed because that will stop the disease, fine. But actually it's, it's, it is a situation where the cure is worse than the disease in some ways. 
All right, let's talk about a good story, a success story, because we've been very depressed so far with very <laughs> negative news, right? So a success story in the garment sector. We might have heard that garments in Cambodia were absolutely incredible in terms of employment generation. So from nothing in 1994, garments becomes 14% of the economy uh, within the span of a, a, a decade and uh, create as many as 350,000 direct jobs and as many indirect jobs, so a total of 750,000. And then you've got the remittances to the countryside, so about a million people are, are helped as a result of, of, of the garment sector. How did this happen? Well, you have a situation where in 1999, the US and Cambodia agreed to link labor to trade to uh, essentially say that if better labor was observed in Cambodia, Cambodia would be allowed to export more to the United States in terms of garments. Uh, but how to do this? Of course, every country is going to claim that labor standards are improving and no one can objectively measure this until and unless you have a third party labor standards monitor. And that turned out to be a program, now, first of all, the incredible thing is that it worked. And it turned out to be this program of the International Labor Organization called Better Factories Cambodia, which essentially became this third party that came into Cambodia and examined Cambodia's factories looked at four or five hundred checkpoints of which, you know, 97% um, compliance with Cambodia's minimum wage, for example. So, so you can actually be confident that the stuff that's made in Cambodia is generally okay. It wasn't made under the most dire conditions, but it's still $60 per month minimum wage, not a lot of money. Uh, it is true that the, 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 um, the garment sector is still very limited to a certain narrow part of the production value chain. So they only cut, make, and trim garments. They do not make the fabric, they do not make the threads, they do not make the buttons. Everything has to be imported and it just gets cut and assembled in Cambodia and then exported out. And it gets, of course, made in Cambodia as a result of that. Now, we look at exports of, of garments during this period of time, incredible explosion. Uh, the only dip being in, in um, 2008, 2009, really. Uh, after that, it, it, it just goes, keeps going on stratospherically and $3.4 billion in exports of garments. Uh, what's the explanation for the success story of, of the garment sector? Uh, well, you know, there's this, um, there's this Garment Manufacturers Association of Cambodia. They were instrumental, really. They, they, they were a bunch of garment manufacturers from, and this is from their website, from such diverse backgrounds as China, Hong Kong, Macau, Malaysia, and Singapore, yeah, very diverse indeed, uh, decided to form this ad hoc unit to represent them as a group instead of being singled out individually when dealing with officials from the Ministry of Commerce, which has been charged by the Royal Government of Cambodia, uh, um, to oversee the export of garments and the issuance of certificates of origin. So this is this is the certificate that says made in Cambodia. And and if you read between the lines, it's saying to deal with it, to deal with it. That it's implying basically to deal with the corruption from these officials. So um, in fact, the argument I would say is that they were able to avoid capture because they had this commonality. They were all from so-called Greater China. They all had a common sort of uh, heritage and maybe even uh, some similar languages uh, or dialects that they could then use to to find um, uh, similar uh, goals in mind. And one of those goals, of course, was to control corruption. So, um, as one garment factory owner uh, told me, you know, we negotiate with each government department. We take ten dollars for inspection instead of thirty-five dollars. We agree. We tell all members of GMAC the cost negotiated is ten dollars. If you don't accept, then you have to refer to your boss, refer to GMAC, etc. So they worked out an arrangement where they could say, you know, we're not going to be nickel and dime throughout the value chain or throughout the government clearance process. We just want to pay $10, and that's how much you know, we're going to do, and you have to accept that. Um, at one point, GMAC was even talking about issuing vouchers, um, a kind of, um, you know, hey, here's a voucher, and you can go and collect your money when you come bring it to GMAC instead of, we hand you cash. But of course, that would make corruption completely transparent. It would say, hey, uh, we basically have a voucher system to like, you know, get your corruption money. And they didn't want to do that. So 
So, but you know, the progress is slow, but it, it worked in this case. Um, let me now move to the fourth case in the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Of course, you know, um, this is an example, again, I think, of how uh, donors have this idea that they're going to bring something to Cambodia, they're going to bring Western standards of justice in this mixed tribunal and somehow teach Cambodians how to run a court properly. And I, I, and I would argue this idea of norm penetration, bringing the norms to Cambodia, has gone terribly wrong because it's, it's in fact been the opposite, that the norms of Cambodia have been invading the tribunal. And uh, of course we know that the first case, Billick, uh, the head of the uh, torture center I talked about uh, earlier in my presentation, uh, confessed in 2009 uh, to his involvement in uh, the activities of that torture center. He was found guilty in uh, 2011 <clears throat> and uh, in causing the deaths of at least 12,273 people and initially sentenced to uh, what was 35 years, reduced to 19 for a time already served in technicalities and so on. And of course, uh, he still didn't think that was, uh, well, he thought that was too short, uh, or he thought that was too long, rather, and he appealed, uh, and the prosecution appealed. Thankfully, he lost, and has now been sentenced to life in prison. But of course, for those of you who are familiar with the American story of this gentleman here, who was that? Anybody? Madoff, right? Bernie Madoff. So Bernie Madoff was uh, sentenced to 150 years, and uh, he had uh, what? Uh, basically killed nobody, uh, but caused you know, $65 billion in fraud. Maybe not even that much. Actually, it's more like $35 billion in fraud, but uh, let's just call it even $65 billion. Um, and he's not appealing because, of course, you know, what's the point? He knows what he did. And you have to wonder about what, I mean, who the monster really is in this case. I mean, we talk about monsters sometimes, and we have to wonder who the monster is. The judge in Madoff's case was very, um, very uh, interesting. He said, you know, he, could, he noted that 20 or 25 years would have effectively been a life sentence for Bernie Madoff, but he reasoned that the symbolism of the longer term was important given the enormity of the crimes. Um, the enormity of the crimes, indeed. So let's bring us back to the tribunal and, of course, the Theodore, who, uh, as many of you know, a couple of months ago was essentially allowed to go home. Um, picked up by her kids, brought home, released due to Alzheimer's uh, just 24 hours ago, 36 hours ago. Her husband passed away, uh, the foreign minister uh, of Democratic Kampuchea at age 87, uh, in Sri. By the way, uh, Ian Tiret, being social affairs minister, I think has a personal sort of relationship with my own family only because uh, as social affairs minister, she was in charge of the hospital ostensibly that uh, probably helped to uh, quicken my own father's death. So, and there's, there's something deeply personal there, but never mind, she's now at home, um, and her husband has escaped justice uh, through death. And I have to think about sort of the, the lesson that, that, you know, how do, how do I reconcile all of this? And I have to think about my own mother's sort of wisdom during, that, during her life and, and how that impacted me. So my mom, who saved five kids from uh, the Khmer Rouge. Uh, now, those five kids have, have gotten 15 uh, children of their own, so 20 lives have been saved. And soon, you know, one more, uh, a, a son of mine will be born at the end of this month. So I, I feel like she, her wisdom is important at this time when, 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 when I try to understand the lack of justice in Cambodia. So, uh, you know, she believed, my mom believed in what goes around comes around, and this idea that uh, essentially, the, the people who had done so much harm to my family would essentially meet their own fate at the end of the day. Uh, maybe not in this lifetime, but in another lifetime. She believed in karmic justice, and that uh, perhaps if they didn't face justice now, in the next life, they'd be reborn cockroaches. <laughs> uh, but more importantly, maybe she was able to forgive the fact that justice wasn't going to be found in her life. Uh, maybe to set that aside as a result of her of her uh, Buddhist views. Uh, and I would argue that for 14 million, going on 15 million Cambodians today, this uh, belief in karmic justice allows them perhaps to uh, go on with their lives. I'm not saying they don't want justice. I just think that, you know, 
What explains the ability of the people to be resilient, to go forward and not want necessarily uh, constant uh, conflict or uh, vengeance? Maybe it's because they believe in karmic justice at some, some level. Let me close with a quote from the book and, and um, a page uh, where I, I, was, I was concluding the book and I, you know, this Coney 2012 video, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, this is the Lord's Resistance Army, Joseph Coney. Um, so this video came out, uh, it was like March of 2012. Uh, in 20 days, 85 million views on YouTube. Uh, it implores viewers to make a difference but as we've seen throughout the cases that I've talked about, um, the, the, the path to disaster is, is, is really paved with good intentions sometimes. So the, the author, Teju Cole, who, who writes for The Atlantic, uh, said this about the Coney 2012 video, and I, I think it applies here as well. There's much more to doing good work than making a difference. There's the principle of first do no harm. There's the idea that those who are being helped ought to be consulted over the matters that concern them. And I would argue, and maybe this is an immodest proposal, that, that a Hippocratic oath, uh, which says, first do no harm when you do development work, uh, undergirded perhaps by a commitment to genuine participation, would be a start. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take your questions.